Welcome to the Versus History Podcast with your hosts, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Connell Smith, and Elliot Watson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of the Versus History Podcast. We are back live and direct. Today, it's me, your host and co-editor, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, a history chappy on Twitter, Instagram, and all those other social media platforms on behalf of the Versus History editorial team. But it's not me. That's the important one. It's our distinguished and special guest. It's Des Powell, who has co-authored a book with Damien Lewis, one of our previous podcast guests, and it's entitled SAS, Bravo 3-0. It's published by Quercus Books towards the end of October 2021, so it will be available very, very soon. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the book because I'm going to leave that to the man himself. Des, welcome to Versus History. We're delighted to have you with us. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much for inviting me on the show. Oh, the pleasure really, really is all ours. I spoke to Damien a couple of times, and no pressure, Des, but he always gives fantastic interviews, and I'm sure you're no different. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, tell us about the book that you've come to write and your formative experiences that have gone into the writing of it. Over to you. Tell us all about you. Okay. Um, I come from uh, Sheffield. I'm Sheffield born and bred. And uh, I left school when I was 15 and I went into the steelworks, in the big steel city, so to speak. Um, I wasn't really pleased with that. And I finished up a few years later uh, joining the armed forces and I joined the parachute regiment. And um, it was a little bit late, really. Uh, I was around about 19 going on 20 years old, which is a little bit late to join the armed forces. Um, but I really enjoyed it. I served in a parachute regiment for approximately uh, eight and a half years. And I did tours of uh, Northern Ireland, uh, Cyprus, um, Germany and Hong Kong. And um, I really enjoyed my time uh, within the parachute regiment. Um, after eight and a half years, I got more serious and I thought, right, I want to go and join the Special Air Service Regiment, the SES. And um, I had a very long career uh, within the regiment. I served there for over 19 years. Um, within the regiment, I uh, joined Air Troop. Uh, Air Troop, you specialize in high altitude uh, free fall parachuting. And I also specialized in VIP protection. Uh, which is sometimes termed as a bodyguard protection. Um, I also specialised in training and in techniques in anti-terrorism, uh, not only within the SES, but also within special forces around the world. Um, I also uh, was lucky enough uh, to um, work in many theatres around the world um, mainly, um, we term this in the SES as covert operations or clandestine operations, if you like. Um, I also um, was uh, trained in uh, medics and demolitions and signals and also managed to um, learn a couple of languages as well. Um, and I really enjoyed my time uh, within the regiment itself by traveling around the world and getting involved in uh, a lot of stuff that you wouldn't normally do in the normal army, so to speak. Um, my total service, including the parachute regiment and the SES, was in total of over 28 years. Uh, after the military, I went into the civil sector, and uh, this is termed the circuit or the media circuit. And this is working for high ranking media organizations, uh, mainly working in uh, war torn countries or volatile countries, uh, mainly in the Middle East, um, Africa, and South America. Um, I did that really, and, and what it was is using my skills that I learned in the Special Forces, and it was really VIP uh, protection for these media groups. Um, I did that for a couple of years and I really enjoyed it. And then after that, I went further on into the civil sector, which is termed 
um, the celebrity circuit. And this is uh, VIP protection at this time for celebrities um, in the area of football. I did security for Spurs Football Club and for such players as uh, Jenny Redknapp, uh, Les Ferdinand and Robbie Keane. Uh, in the television, I looked after uh, uh, Jeremy Kyle and uh, Jim Davison. And in the film world, I worked on the Bond film sets where I looked after such celebrities as Piers Brosnan and Halle Berry. Um, and I, again, I really enjoyed that. Um, that more or less brought me up to date. And I'm now uh, living in UK and I divide my time um, between UK and the UAE, mainly Dubai, where I used to live. Wow, that is some CV that must run into some pages. If you were sent away to a desert island, that's your scenario for five whole years, and you can only take the following with you. There's one musical album, one drink aside from water. You've got unlimited supplies of that. And one book with you for company. What would they be and why? So one album, one drink, and one book, just to try and get to know the Des Pal behind the CV. Over to you. Okay, music. I can go the full range, actually. Some days I can listen to Frank Sinatra. Um, I can bring it further up to date and listen to Michael Bublé. Uh, but then I can be really modern, and I, I actually like Bruno Mars. Um, so I, but just lately I've been into uh, music, which is on the internet, called uh, Postmodern Jukebox. And, um, and what that is, it's modern-day music, uh, but they put all sorts of, um, uh, for example, they may add jazz to it, or they may add rap to it. Um, or they may add swing to it. So you can have Monday music with a different theme. So I've been listening to that and I quite like that. So um, it would probably be music from postmodern jukebox um, because you tend to get a lot of variety, if you like. Um, Good choice. I think, um, okay, <laughs> you, you put me on the spot, so I'll pick one. Um, I'll tell you what, let's pick an album by Michael Bublé, Okay. Go for it. I like that. It will certainly be fitting at Christmas. All right, that's the, that's the album. What, what drink are you taking with it? Okay, so uh, I'm an alcoholic drinker. I, I don't drink alcohol, but um, what I do, especially lately with the book coming out, I spend a lot of my time in coffee bars um, drinking coffee, and I like uh, cafe lattes. And my eldest son has got me interested in uh, oat milk lattes, so um, if it was possible that <laughs> I could take a drink uh, on this island, I realised I might need a coffee machine, but uh, um, any um, cafe latte drink. And, and I'm, as I said, I'm particularly fond of these uh, oat milk lattes now. So if that's um, uh, if I could do that, that would be nice. Yeah, you certainly can. All we need from you now is one book or magazine or publication for a bit of light reading. What, what would you say, apart from your one, oh. obviously? Yeah, yeah. So um, what I do, I, I'm into personal development, uh, Patrick, you know, and uh, I was in the USA some years ago and I managed to meet up with Anthony Robbins and um, I quite liked his seminars on, on uh, personal development. Um, but we have a guy here in the UK and he's, he's brought out a book uh, called, uh, quite a few years ago, called Warrior by Jeff Thompson. And, and it, it says in the book, where have all the warriors gone? And uh, it talks about the modern day warriors, not only men, but women as well. And uh, um, it's a great book by Jeff Thompson. So if I was uh, going to take a book onto this island, the warrior would be the one I would take. Cracking trio of choices, Des. Thank you very much indeed. All right. The question about your book then, please set the scene for us. What's it all about in short? And why is it so important right now? So yeah, my book is called uh, SES Bravo 30, and it's about the war back in 1991. Um, I think most people can remember the story of Bravo 20 by the author Andy McNabb, and he talked about the problems that his patrol had uh, out in Iraq at that time. What a lot of people don't realize is that there were three patrols, uh, Bravo 1-0, Bravo 2-0, and my patrol, Bravo 3-0. Uh, our mission was to find and locate mobile 
scud rockets that were being fired from the Iraqi desert into neighbouring countries with the intention of creating instability within the Middle East and actually creating a massive war within that part of the world. And undoubtedly, um, it would bring about uh, a massive loss of life. And it was our job to uh, prevent that. Um, The reason I'm pleased about this book coming out is that they've now given me permission this year to actually write about my story. And uh, the publication is is, uh, is coming about soon. Um, and I'm pleased because it's, uh, it, it's a great book, um, and not only in terms of uh, modern history, but I think in the book there's something for everyone. Um, not only does it talk about the mission itself and the um, problem, but it talks about other missions that I've been involved in and also it it talks about uh, certain areas of my life as well so um, yes it's uh, it's a great book and I'm sure people will like it thank you very much Des all right I know this isn't the focus of the book but there may be a good few people out there that have never really heard of the Gulf first Gulf War or never studied it so could you very very briefly outline Uh, as quickly and concisely as you can, the key causes and events of that Gulf War. So people could just orientate your book into the wider history and contextualise it. So the Gulf War, what caused it and what happened in short? Over to you. Uh, Yes, back in the late summer of 1990, um, Iraqi military forces invaded Kuwait. Uh, This came about really because the leader at that time, uh, Saddam Hussein, had been at war for many, many years, in fact, all through the 80s, uh, with its neighbour, uh, Iran. And they had been locked in fierce fighting, uh, with the result of um, approximately half a million people dead. What Saddam had done because of his fighting with Iran, it virtually bankrupted his country. He was looking towards oil rich Kuwait, a bordering country, as the answer to his problems. Um, he was also, by the invasion of Kuwait, sending out a strong message to the rest of the world that Iraq was the biggest and strongest country within the Middle East. And now he had an army which was the third largest in the world. And now he was a force to be reckoned with. So because of this, the United Nations gave him an ultimatum for him to withdraw his troops by the 15th of January 1991. Uh, Because of this, we saw the largest formation of troops ever uh, since the Second World War. There was hundreds of thousands of troops that formed up uh, within uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. In fact, they were called multinational coalition forces from all countries around the world. And they formed up in Saudi Arabia, ready to cross the border into Iraq and Kuwait uh, to um, oust Saddam Hussein from Kuwait itself. Um, the objective was quite simple, uh, the liberation of Kuwait itself. So the scene was set. Um, Saddam had invaded Kuwait. Uh, We had the largest forces that we'd seen since the Second World War. Uh, Commanders were seeing it that um, there was going to be uh, instability within the Middle East. And it was possible that there was going to be a massive war. And this meant a massive loss of life. Thank you very much indeed. You did a great job with that one. Okay, then, segueing back to your personal experiences within this conflict. One of the episodes discussed in the book is how you were part of a low-level insertion into Iraq on board an RAF Chinook helicopter, which took a turn for the worse when it was suddenly locked onto by a Western coalition fighter jet. The helicopter was thrown around the sky by the pilot in an attempt to get free, uh, ejecting chaff to uh, divert any incoming air-to-air missiles. The fact you were here today is proof that you escaped with your life. Could you tell us more about that harrowing, uh, obviously distressing episode uh, which you talk about in the book? Uh, yes, in fact, my mind's going back now. Uh, I remember it was uh, 
a very testing and I don't mind saying a, a scary time. Um, and just to set the scene even further, um, the Chinook helicopter that we're in is a large twin engine uh, heavy lift helicopter. Uh, this helicopter is 30 meters in length and it weighs several tons. Um, it can travel in excess of speeds of over 300 kilometers an hour. And the pilot was flying this only 50 foot off the ground. And he was doing this, in fact, they call it nap of the earth flying. And he does it so we can evade radar uh, being detected. And it was a strange feeling, a strange scenario, if you like, is that we are, uh, you know, quite a few hundred miles inside enemy territory. We are traveling at high speed, uh, only 50 foot off the ground. And now it looks like we're going to be shot down by um, a coalition aircraft, just simply because they don't know who we are. Um, the chaff that was being thrown out from the aircraft is, is a way of, of diverting a heat-seeking missile coming from an aircraft. And it is, it's a strange experience because the only way I can describe it is like fireworks that's being set off all at once. You're in the aircraft and you'll see all this light outside. And you, it was confusing because I'm not sure whether we were receiving a small arms fire from the ground or whether a rocket was inbound. And yes, it was a, a very, very scary experience. Um, at one stage, we were so low uh, going towards the ground that I thought we were going to crash. As you can imagine, the aircraft was leering to the left and then leering to the right, uh, just to evade this uh, lock-on from this aircraft. What I realised, Patrick, is that there's not really much you can do because you're a passenger on that aircraft. And, and it dawned on me that um, here we are on this aircraft uh, behind enemy lines. Uh, no one knows we are there. Um, and we invite to be mistaken for an enemy aircraft. And I thought to myself is that we've only just started this mission. And there's a very good chance we're going to be shot out in the sky. Um, but a testament to the Special Forces air crews um, that I'm here today and speak about this uh, incident it actually shows you how good these pilots are. But no, I don't mind saying that it was a very, very scary experience. And um, it's not something that, uh, um, uh, yeah, you want to happen too often. Absolutely. The harrowing tales don't stop there because another episode of your book talks about another fight for your life, which was environmental this time when Iraq suffered perhaps its coldest winter on record back in 1991. Your patrol narrowly avoided fatal hypothermia. Of all the things that you could think about in a combat situation that might kill you, I think hypothermia would probably be down the bottom of some, well, many people's lists, including mine. However, hypothermia is serious, serious business. So how did the situation come to be and how did you all manage to survive it? Um, yes, is that um, the hyperfermer is, is, is very, very serious. And um, the, 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 it, it come about because of various things is that um, at first is the, the weather. Uh, we were told that we were going to have a, a very, very, very mild English spring type weather in Iraq. It was going to be similar to a spring in UK. And obviously, Patrick, you have no control over the weather itself. And in fact, it was one of the coldest uh, winters that they'd had on record within Iraq. And it was sub-zero temperatures. And so we don't have any control over the weather. So th that was one factor. And yes, the, the way we can uh, deal with hypothermia, it's, it's a very, very serious condition. And in the regiment, um, we uh, are training this to basically recognise it, because recognising the early signs, well, then you can do something about it. And what people don't realise about hypothermia is that um, the mind goes fairly early. And what I mean by that is that you become confused, you become foggy. Um, you become lethargic, uh, you feel quite tired and don't know what to do. Um, for example, if Des in the patrol starts to act a little bit strange and erratic, 
uh, well, then it's a very good chance that Des is going down with hypothermia. And obviously, the members of my patrol would notice this. So within the regiment, and especially within your close-knit patrol, you are always monitoring each other and, and uh, looking for signs that don't look uh, right. So that's one thing, because if you have clarity of mind, you are able to do something about it. And that doing something about it are, are sometimes relatively simple techniques. And, and one of them is layering of clothing, and we actually call it the layered method. And so in a cold environment, you place on your body as many layers of clothing as you can. And they don't have to be thick layers. They can be quite thin because what happens is when you put on several layers, you trap air between them layers and that air creates warmth. So uh, putting on layers of clothing um, creates more heat in the body. So that's one. Uh, another one is very basic, but uh, having hot drinks and hot food. Now, when we was out in Iraq, we're on a routine called hard routine. And for obvious reasons, you can't cook uh, food and you can't heat hot drinks simply because you don't want to be compromised by the enemy. But because at that time it was so cold and we realized that we were fighting the elements, what we did, uh, we broke that routine and we started to make uh, get hot food downers and make hot drinks. And obviously food is calories. Uh, calories uh, in the body creates energy and energy creates heat within the body. So, I mean, uh, food uh, and hot drinks creating heat within um, this is, is obviously one of the more sensible things to do. Um, and also, it's a psychological thing, uh, Patrick. How many times have you been in a cold environment and you decide to go to a vendor and you have a hot drink and it just makes you feel good? So psychologically, it makes you feel good as well. Um, another technique is, is kind of sharing body warmth. Uh, I've been in situations where um, a guy has been injured, even shot even. And his temperature will plummet because of that. So we place him in a sleeping bag and another guy will get in the sleeping bag with him to create more warmth. Um, so what we did in the Gulf, we found that you can still keep alert, but keep close together, which creates heat amongst pairs, if you like. Um, there's other things you can do is by getting out of the windshield, because sometimes the temperature can lower but the wind chill, the wind, the wind itself, can lower the temperature even further. So what you do, you can get uh, uh, around buildings, uh, behind a wall. And in our case, it was behind the vehicles to prevent the, the wind chill from getting to us. So uh, a lot of these techniques are quite basic. So the first one is, 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 is the mental side, is just making sure that you're not acting erratic or strange. Uh, the other one is the layered method of layered clothing, uh, hot drinks, uh, um, uh, hot food, and shared body warmth. And out in Iraq, um, when it was bitterly cold, um, we employed these techniques. Um, probably one thing that I want to point out, which is uh, quite sobering really, is that at that time out there in the Gulf in 1991, is that the Iraqi desert was so cold that um, members of my regiment and guys that I know uh, died of hypothermia. Simply, the weather was too cold. Uh, yes, uh, another factor is uh, logistics. And, and logistics is uh, equipment. And sometimes, because of the speed of the conflict and how fast it moves along, uh, getting the equipment to marry up with you at the same time, uh, so bringing cold weather care in, as in clothing, and equipment, it doesn't always happen fast enough. Um, so logistics play a role as well. Um, also as well, there is um, the, the role that we were playing is that initially we weren't going in as the Bravo patrols. We had two large squadrons, which was um, A squadron and D squadron, which was forming up on the border ready to move across into the Iraqi desert. And all we were, were there to support them. We were there uh, really to, if there was any casualties or any deaths, we will battle casualty replacements. 
and that was our role at the beginning. But the speed of ops and the way it goes is that things change very, very quickly. So the weather, the logistics and the roles that you play uh, within the conflict change all the time. And obviously, you don't have any control over that. OK, then moving on to the last couple of questions. But I think this is one that civilians like me probably often ask people like you that have, have served in the armed forces. It's an obvious question. But I think it's a really important one. Um, I'm sure you've been asked it before. But here we go. Um, were you ever scared, Des? And, and how do you prepare yourself mentally and physically for such a gruelling, potentially fatal endeavour? Um, yes, the answer to that is uh, yes. Uh, in fact, scared all the time. In fact, I was asked this question just a few weeks ago. Someone said, Des, what's the most scared you've ever been? And um, is that uh, I said earlier on that um, I joined Air Troop in the SES, and that is high altitude free fall parachuting. And this is a, a very, very scary uh, endeavor. Is just to set the scene. You are normally in uh, an aircraft 25,000 feet uh, up in the air and you are breathing oxygen. Um, you are carrying weights of over 200 pounds. Uh, this is your military equipment. Uh, this is your weapon. And you are then uh, breathing oxygen. Uh, it is normally uh, cold. You're jumping at night. Um, and then when you exit the aircraft with your uh, patrol, it could be four men, six men, eight men, um, you are reaching speeds in the air in free fall in excess of over 120 miles an hour. And you find that your um, equipment is freezing up. Your altimeters will freeze, your goggles will freeze, and the equipment that you are breathing um, uh, will also freeze. Um, there's also problems of um, colliding in the air. And also, you're also trying to uh, find um, uh, uh, your own space within the air so you don't uh, collide with equipment so you can land safely. And as you can appreciate, this is very, very scary. So uh, every time someone says to me, what's the most scariest time? And I always say, uh, uh, the altitude free fall parachuting, especially at night and especially in a cold environment. Absolutely petrifying. I can't begin to imagine what it's like. Um, thank you for sharing that there. So before we wrap up and go through the details of the book, is there anything else that you would wish to add can, before we conclude or re highlight or reiterate that perhaps the questions that I've asked, my limited short sighted questions, haven't given you the chance to talk about? I suppose um, the book itself, um, I'm really pleased that it's, it's coming out. And I think if there's anything that anyone can get from this book, um, especially in uh, what's happened with the pandemic, is that I think reading the book, you may be able to gain some sort of strength, if you like. And I always think of it like this, is that if uh, a guy from me, um, who originated from Sheffield, who worked in the steelworks, and then eventually joined the parachute regiment, and then joined the SES, and then eventually writes a book and talks about it, um, well, then if I can do it, uh, anyone can do it. But um, yes, so if anyone uh, gets anything from this book, hopefully it's, uh, it's that message. An inspiring one of that, this. Thank you very much indeed. So let's talk about the book then. When and where can people get hold of this? We'll no doubt be running some competitions um, for the Versus History social media pages, but if someone wants to go out and spend their hard-earned cash to buy it, when and where can they get hold of this, Des? Uh, yes, it's uh, coming out uh, this month, the 28th, of October, um, you will see that uh, you can get it from uh, most major bookstores and from all major supermarkets uh, on uh, social media. Uh, there will be links on my social media and on Damien's social media as well. Um, and you can uh, order it from Amazon and from Quirkus Publishing itself as well. 
That's absolutely great. Well, on behalf of myself, the listeners and the co-editors of Versus History Des, we've been honoured to have you with us today. It's been great to hear your story so eloquently put and, and so detailed, so insightful. And I just can't wait to get hold of the book. I've not read it yet, but when it comes out, I'll be grabbing a copy and I'll buy another one to put it up for a competition on Versus History. So listeners, please keep your eyes and ears peeled. And if you want to get a copy gratis on behalf of me, um, just, just stay tuned. Des, well, thank you very much for giving up your time to come and talk to us today. All the best to you and Damien on this book, SAS Bravo 30. It's going to be an absolute barn burner. So thanks for sharing your time with us and your expertise to talk to us all about your new book, SAS Bravo 30. Uh, thank you very much, Patrick, and thank you very, very much for inviting me on your show. Uh, you can come back anytime. All the best, Des. Okay, bye bye, Patrick. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Versus History Podcast. Visit us at www.versushistory.com and follow us at Versus History on Twitter and Instagram. You can download all episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or from wherever you get your podcasts.